Uh, just leaves me to present Graham Harmon to you. He's a professor of philosophy and associate provost for research administration at the American University in Cairo. Um, he's a prolific writer, both on his blog and in publication, having authored 10 books to date, or it was at the time of going to press, it could very easily have been more by now, um, including work on Bruno Latour, Quentin Mersu, and H.P. Lovecraft. Um, his work has been at the forefront of a phase change in philosophy to work through the challenges um, of the philosophy of access. His paper today, Art and Paradox, discusses two types of paradox and how they relate to art. So uh, I'll just pass over to Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you. What I will do today is I will talk a bit about object-oriented philosophy, uh, knowing that some of you might not be very familiar with it and some of you very familiar with it. So I'll try to speak in a way that is interesting to both groups. I also promise to speak slowly. I've had that request in advance, and I'm always guilty of speaking too quickly. Uh, even my mother complains that I speak too quickly. So I will try to keep this nice and slow. I also, uh, of course, I'll talk about art. I don't know if I'll talk about the Anthropocene. I will try to maybe say something in passing just to tie together with your other theme. And you all heard Levi's paper yesterday, so I might offer my own opinions about what the differences in our philosophical positions are, and maybe something about Gabriel's position, which is close but also different uh, from that very interesting presentation this morning. But first I will start in the way that American high school students start, by saying that the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary defines paradox as a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet is perhaps true. Well, you know about Zeno's paradoxes, but one of the other uh, founders of paradox in philosophy, believe it or not, was Aristotle. Aristotle could be considered the founder of object-oriented philosophy because Aristotle is the first person in the history of Western philosophy who uh, did not choose one privileged thing to be the substance, did not choose water, did not choose atoms, uh, objects of, he still had some restrictions. Things had to be natural to be substances for Aristotle, but, but there could be many different kinds of things. They could be horses, trees, and so forth. He was also the first to say that a substance need not be eternal. Philosophers in the West before Aristotle, when they were looking for the substance, were always looking for something that lasts forever, from which everything else is built. Not for Aristotle. You can kill a horse, and yet a horse can still be a substance. And I mention this at the start because uh, Aristotle's at the low crest of his popularity right now. There always has to be one or two great philosophers who are beaten up at any given moment. When I was a graduate student in the early 1990s, it was Plato. You had to despise Plato and try to reverse Plato in every one of your papers and say that we're beyond Platonism every time you speak. That seems to have been, have ended. Plato seems to have been rehabilitated for some reason. The two philosophers now we beat up on, one is Aristotle, one is Edmund Husserl, and I'm going to have good things to say about both of them today. In any case, why, why substances are paradoxical for Aristotle, it's because they can have different qualities at different times. Green is always green, heavy is always heavy, but Socrates can be happy and sad at different times. And yet Socrates must also have certain things that make him Socrates at all times. So there's a paradox already in the idea of objects. So I want to talk about two philosophical paradoxes today and how art relates to them. The first paradox is that reality is both accessible and inaccessible. We know that reality seems to be accessible in some ways because we seem to gain knowledge. We seem to become more enlightened about things over time. We seem to know more about diseases now and about engineering problems and about uh, various other things over time. Knowledge seems to increase. And this is the model of enlightenment that uh, dominates continental philosophy, uh, I would say, today. If you look at Badiou and Zizek, is still is the two pillars of continental philosophy as it is today. And if you look at Meassou and Brassier as extending this in some sense, uh, there's this idea that I call epistemism, a term that I coined, epistemism, the idea that direct knowledge of the world must be possible. But at the same time, it's not possible. Why not? Well, Socrates first noticed this. Socrates, with the word philosophia, which means love of wisdom, not wisdom, is the claim that only a god can have knowledge Humans do not have, have this knowledge. Humans can at best get closer to the truth. And I take that very seriously. Philosophy was never meant to be a kind of knowledge. Uh, if, you, if you go for knowledge, if you go for wisdom, you have Sophia, you end up with sophism, according to Socrates. You end up with the sophists. Any claim to direct knowledge must be discounted. I think, again, you also see this in Aristotle. Why? 
Because Aristotle says individual things cannot be defined. Why can't individual things be defined? Because definitions use universals. You're using adjectives that can apply to many things. So you cannot define a person, you cannot define an individual thing. There's always some excess of the thing beyond any attempt to define or know it. And then of course, this is one of the pillars of, of recent philosophy, starting with Kant, the notion of the thing in itself that cannot be grasped. Um, that's the idea that we cannot have direct access to the things in themselves. They are at best a regulative idea, something we can approach. And of course, Heidegger picks this up again too, another formidable figure in 20th century philosophy. The idea that the truth is always veiled from us, that it's concealed or sheltered. Um, the kind of philosophy I called epistemism earlier, Badiou, Zizek, Mersou, Brassier, these people tend to side more with Hegel. They don't, they don't take Kant's notion of the thing in itself seriously because they see this as already having been refuted by the German idealists who say that to think of a thing in itself outside thought is already to convert it into a thought and therefore it's already contradictory to think of something outside thought. Uh, Mayasu claims to attack that but he doesn't. He actually preserves that idea. And this same group of contemporary thinkers that I call the epistemists. <laughs> sounds pretty routine to me. <laughs> but we don't want to be sitting through this atrocity if one is occurring. <laughs> and the same group of, of figures also praise and ignore Heidegger. What, what's very interesting about Badiou, Zizek, also Mayasu, is that any one of them will tell you, yes, of course, Heidegger is one of the greatest philosophers of all time, and yet they, they make almost no use of him. Very little use of him. And that's because they cannot incorporate this notion that reality is something inaccessible, ungraspable, foreign to human access. It's simply something they can't do anything with because their model of philosophy does not allow it. So that's the first model of, uh, first paradox uh, I'm talking about today. One is that it's that reality is both accessible and inaccessible. In some sense, we must have access to it. In other ways, it completely eludes us. Second paradox is that reality, on the one hand, is discovered, on the other hand, it's constructed. Obviously, on the one hand, reality is something discovered, something that pre-exists us, because we do not create things ex nihilo by knowing them, unless you want to take a very strong idealist position. We don't think fossils were simply generated for us when we're digging. At least reasonable people do not think that. We do not think that um, anything is not there prior to our discovering it. We do not think that the planet uh, Neptune was generated at the moment of human discovery of it, and so forth. And yet there's also an obvious sense in which, the, with, in which reality is constructed because you need to go through all kinds of preliminary uh, machinations in order to get at the truth. My favorite uh, formulation of this is in Bruno Latour's uh, claim that we shouldn't have a, um, a um, uh, correspondence model of truth, but an industrial model of truth. That the truth uh, has to be transformed at each stage in order to be understood by the next stage. What, how many transformations are needed from crude oil in the geological seams of Saudi Arabia to get into the gas tank of your car somewhere else? A number of refinements are needed, a number of transportations are needed. The same with truth. You don't have a direct uh, link with reality. All right, so with these two uh, paradoxes, is reality uh, accessible or inaccessible? Is it discovered or constructed? We have four options if we combine these. We have a nice little fourfold. And one always famous method in philosophy is to look at four options like this and see that three of them have already been tried and another has not. And I'm going to do that here. Um, Mayasu does this at the end of his very nice book, L'Inexistence Divine, when he says, his four are, we can believe in God because he exists, that's the theist. We can uh, not believe in God because he doesn't exist, that's the atheist. And then there are the two more complicated ones. One of them is you can uh, not believe in God because he exists, you know, be the one who curses God, like Lucifer or Captain Ahab and Moby Dick, and so then uh, Mayasu offers the fourth option, which is to believe in God because he doesn't exist. What he means by that is that um, how can we forgive God for all the horrible crimes of the 20th century? Because God didn't exist yet, but God might exist in the future. So we, we believe in God because he's not here yet. Well, I'm going to offer a different version of this. One of them is you could say that the truth is something discovered rather than constructed, and it is accessible. And that is what I call mathematism. That's the idea there is a world out there, and you can know it. Mayasu, again, is a good example of this. You can discover eternal truths, Descartes. You can use reason to get at uh, the direct features of reality. 
You could also say that reality is something discovered, but it's not accessible. And this would be Kant, this would also be Ray Brassier. The idea that the truth is a telos. Rather than mathematism, this tends to be scientism. The truth can only be approached. It can never be directly grasped. Uh, advocates of a scientistic philosophy have to say this for the simple uh, reason that there is theory change in science in a way that there is not in mathematics. Mathematics expands, but it never changes. Um, mathematics, we, when you add non-Euclidean geometry, you're not refuting Euclidean geometry. You are um, simply using different axioms and postulates that Euclid did not, and you're expanding the mathematical to untested realms. It's different in science, where one theory refutes another, and there's a school of philosophy of science that disputes this called uh, structural realism, which believes that a certain amount of mathematical content is preserved from one theory in, in science to the next. But this just converts scientism into mathematism. It's the belief that reality can be directly known. Scientism has to concede that, well, we're sort of going towards this scientific conception of reality. We're never there. We're never going to get there. Okay, you can also add a third option, which is to say that the, the reality is constructed and it's accessible. This would be any, any postmodern theory which thinks there's no reality hiding behind signifiers or our access to it. And also you find this in, in Vico, uh, Jean-Baptiste de Vico, who says that we can understand human things because we made them. There is a direct accessibility to the things we make. So what's the fourth option never tried? Fourth option never tried is that reality is inaccessible and it's also constructed. This seems paradoxical. If we construct something, we should be able to master it, right? We should be able to have some knowledge of it. I'm saying that uh, it may be the case that reality, is, even though we construct it in some sense, is inaccessible for reasons I will explain. And I, uh, this may be true only for arts. It may not be true for the other things. But I would hold that it's at least true for arts. And it's also not without precedent. It should be obvious, I think, that um, introspection has no privileged access to reality, even though it's we ourselves who are looking at ourselves. If introspection were perfectly transparent and lucid, there would be no psychoanalysis. So it's not the case that we, uh, we understand what is closest to us always. All right, let me talk a bit about realism. I belong to speculative realism in philosophy. Realism was, was quite unfashionable in continental philosophy until about 10 years ago when I wrote, uh, published a book called Tool Being, Defending It. Manuel Delanda, the same year, published an excellent book on Deleuze called Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy that defended realism very stringently. And I hold that re the reality is inaccessible. No form of knowledge can be congruent with what it knows. My favorite example, knowledge of a tree does not itself become a tree. And everyone says, yeah, but no one claims that. No one claims that knowledge of a tree is itself a tree. And I say, of course no one claims that because no one performs a reductio ad absurdum proof on themselves. It's my job to show that that's what it leads to. If you believe that knowledge of a thing is the same, is, there's no difference between the knowledge of the thing and the thing, you are going to be led either to some inc incredible idealist position where, you're, where your thinking of something generates it into existence, or you're going to have to some, come up with some kind of theory, and the burden is on you, uh, to explain the difference between my knowledge of something and the thing. And when people do that, it always ends up being some sort of lame traditional theory that there's form and hearing and matter, and you know, I take the form out of the thing and copy it in my mind. But that's, I don't think that's the kind of theory people want when they're waving the banners of this exciting new scientism. They're claiming to do something new, not to retrogress to that kind of theory. I also wrote a, a small notebook uh, for Documenta this summer in Castle called The Third Table. They commissioned 100 people to write little notebooks, put them all in a catalog. What The Third Table is, was, is a response to Eddington's famous metaphor of the two tables from the 1920s. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, of course, is the one who, whose observations helped solidify Einstein's general relativity. Um, but he later gave the, uh, gave the Gifford Lectures in Edinburgh and said, there are two tables. There's the, the practical table that I'm sitting at, which is solid, and I move it around. I, I use it for various functions. I put water on it. But then there's the scientific table, which is mostly empty space made of electrons and quarks, we now know. Um, and these are the two tables. And Eddington goes on to defend the, the scientific table as being the source of the practical table, which is derivative, which can be reduced to the scientific table. It occurred to me when I was commissioned to write this, this little notebook that uh, neither of those is the real table. Those are two forms of reducing the table. The table cannot be reduced to its ultimate physical constituents for the simple reason that you can change those constituents within certain limits and not change what the table is. You don't need to know about the exact status of every electron in the table uh, for it to be treated as the same table. So there's a kind of emergence there. 